Okay, um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my background is in integrated science, physics, and math. Um, I went to grad school for physics, uh, but did research in computational neuroscience. And at grad school, I, had to, I was exposed to a lot of machine learning techniques. Um, after graduating, I've worked in science education and at a few tech companies, and currently I'm a data scientist at ShiftGig. And if you want to hear more about ShiftGig, you should come to my other talk on Sunday. Okay. So um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with PyMC3. Um, it's a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, sampling library. Um, uh, and some of the main features are that it allows you to do probabilistic programming, which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with, especially if you were at the pomegranate talk this morning. Um, the way I like to think about it is that it allows us to treat our parameters in our uh, regression problems as arising from distributions rather than just from point estimates. Um, so this allows us to do things like insert prior knowledge into the model um, and give us some idea of the error of our point estimates of the different parameters. Um, you can use it for Bayesian statistical modeling, model fitting, it's written in Python, um, and PyMC3 usually has cutting edge uh, sampling algorithms and variational inference techniques. Okay. So a question I'm sure anyone who's familiar with PyMC3 or PyStan will have is, why did you choose PyMC3? It's because PyMC3 is written in Python. That is the only reason. I didn't want to learn Stan. Okay. Um, some of you may already be familiar with PyMC2. Uh, PyMC3 is still in beta, so if you're uncomfortable with beta software, you might want to consider using PyMC2. Um, because it is a bit older, though, uh, it doesn't always have the newest sampling techniques built into it, uh, but it is a lot more stable. So I initially started working with PyMC2, uh, but had a lot of trouble getting my models to converge. Um, things were taking like three weeks. I was totally throwing off my sprints. Um, so I switched to PyMC3. So I've been a lot happier with performance, but there's definitely, you're gonna find bugs in PyMC3. Um, the developers are super nice though, and they respond really quickly if you uh, open issues on GitHub or um, email them, any of that stuff. Okay, so this is what I'm planning on covering. Um, just setting up a basic model in PyMC3, sampling from your model, obviously that's what you're gonna wanna do. Um, predicting new data, if you have, say, a test set or a new set of data. Um, saving a trace from your model so that you can use it later. Um, and that's usually specifically in the case you might need to make an API call to your model and you might wanna be predicting one data point. Okay, so the specific models I'm gonna go over are linear regression, hierarchical linear regression or linear model, and logistic regression and hierarchical logistic regression. Um, so obviously, you probably wouldn't use PyMC3 for just basic linear regression. You'd use scikit-learn or something easier. Um, but this is mostly just to show you the PyMC3 syntax. Um, and this will allow you to build, um, build up model, more complicated models. Okay, any questions about the outline? All right, cool. Let's go. Hopefully, you guys managed to download some stuff. Um, if not... Hopefully the Wi-Fi will start working for you soon. Okay, let's see if I can switch over to the notebook. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay, hmm. One downside is I cannot see it because I didn't mirror. So hold on while I try and fix that. Yay, okay, I can see it now too. All right, um, so if you managed to get the repo downloader and everything, um, the notebook I'm going through is Quick Start Guide with Errors. Um, there's another version without the errors in it in case you want a reference for the future. And then there's a couple of other examples I forgot to take out, so they're yours now. Um, <laughs> one is a linear hierarchical example and one is logistic regression. Um, those examples are already inside the Quick Start Guide with Errors. Okay, 
So um, first, obviously, there's some um, imports. We want PyMC3. Um, PyMC3 uses Theano. Theano is the back end. Does anyone know how to pronounce that? All right, Theano it is. Um, and obviously, we'll use a few different libraries as well. So hopefully, if all your setup worked, that should work. Um, you can ignore this because I'll explain in a second. Um, some other stuff. I make I like making my figures gigantic so everyone can read the text. Okay. So first up is linear regression. Um, I set up the notebook in such a way that you should be able to adapt it to your real data. Um, one of the problems I had when I was going through a lot of the examples that exist online is that the examples are very specific to uh, like a set number of features and set number of feature names. They weren't really generalizable. So this is meant to be a very generalizable example. So you specify the number of features. So in this case, I said 10. If you have 100, if you have two, you can change it to whatever you want. Um, and then I'm just saying the number of observed uh, data points is 1,000. Pretty basic. Um, so we're doing linear regression. So y equals alpha plus beta x. So we're going to choose random values uh, for alpha and beta, which is here. Um, and then we're going to create some fake predictor data. And then we're going to try and use uh, PyMC3 to figure out the alphas and betas. All right. Um, so here I'm just calculating the, uh, the fake data and throwing in a little bit of noise. OK. So uh, now we'll get to the first PyMC3 start. So with, a, with PyMC3, the first thing you have to do is instantiate a model. And it's conveniently called model. Um, and once you have your model, you can use a with statement and then specify some things about your model. Um, so we obviously want to have uh, a parameter for alpha. And we're going to say that it's normally distributed. Uh, you can give it a name alpha. Um, and then you can specify the mean. And then you can either specify the um, standard deviation or the precision. You can use either one. Um, they're called sigma or tau. And here's the formula, in case you didn't know. Um, this is a slight difference from PyMC2. Um, in PyMC2, I think you had to use tau. Um, I don't know. I assume they thought everyone used standard deviations. Um, and then finally, you specify the shape uh, or size. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the betas, um, except for this time, we know we want to have one beta for each of the features. Um, I'm going to throw in a little bit of noise, um, and then we're going to um, add up the data, uh, calculate the y values. Um, so here you can see where I'm throwing in the actual data, x train. All right. And then we are throwing all of that inside another normal distribution, and we're saying that the observed data uh, is the fake data that I created before. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so then you can run it. So I ran this notebook yesterday morning, and then I ran it again today, and there wasn't an error. And in the last 16 hours, somebody submitted a pull request that fixed this error that I was first going to tell you about. So there used to be a problem with strings and unicodes, where they would give you this super useless error saying that uh, they needed a string but got alpha or something like that. Um, and it was really confusing. And I spent a couple hours on it because I'm not a software engineer. And then I finally went to the director of backend engineering. And he was like, oh, it's a Unicode byte string thing. I was like, what the hell is that? Uh, but you don't need to worry about it anymore. So it should work. <laughs> um, but if you're wondering why I cast everything as byte strings, it's because I'm using Python 2.7. And I needed to do that to get the code to work. And the reason it was breaking before is because I was working in an environment that somebody else had set up. And they had put in this from future import Unicode literals. And I wasn't aware of that. And so it was messing everything up. But not your problem anymore, because it was just fixed. So convenient. OK. So uh, here you can see it still works with Unicode or byte strings. All right. Um, so now that we have the model set up, we want to actually sample from it. Um, so you can do that with another with statement. You can set the step, um, which is the sampler. Um, so in this case, I'm using the nut sampler. Uh, so you just say what the sampler is, and then you just tell, the, uh, you just sample. Just 
press the sample. So it might take a little while, but hopefully it'll come through. Uh, any questions while this is running? No, okay, awesome. All right, so you get this nice little progress bar. If you had more samples, it would take longer. Um, you can see it's done, and so um, one thing people like to do is have a burn-in period with their samples a lot. Um, so if you wanna have a burn-in period, you can just index on the trace um, however much you want your burn-in period to be. So it's pretty easy. Um, and they have this nice function called trace plot, which will uh, plot all of your variables for you. Um, so we can see here uh, the distribution of the alpha samples, um, the sample values over time, same thing with the betas, um, and the noise. Um, so it looks like it's, you know, relatively converged, it's pretty good. Um, there's also a summary function, um, which will just spit out a description of all these things that you've created. Um, so here's alpha, we can see the mean of the distribution, the standard deviation, um, posterior quantiles, and the same thing for all of the betas, which is pretty good. Um, so here we can go back, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a few, I think, analytical tests. Usually I check to see um, if, the, if the distributions are really pointed like these betas are. Um, so it seems like they're centered around one point. Um, if you looked at it before you had done much of the sampling, it would be really spread out. It wouldn't be as pointed. Um, and here on the other side, you can see how the sample value is changing um, over time. Um, if you were looking at it, uh, if I didn't do the burn-in period, you would most likely see something where the alpha value started at some random starting point and then moved down, slowly moved, it would jump around and slowly move down to whatever the real value is. Um, I think there's some other tests and things you can do as well. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so since we simulated this data, we know what the, act the answer is, so we can check. So alpha was negative 0.51, so if we go back up to the summary, we see the model found negative 0.52. It's probably good enough for this tutorial. Um, if you need more precision, you can uh, spend your time fixing your model, working on different samplers, whatever you wanna do. Um, same thing with the betas, if we go look, they seem like they're heading in the right direction, at least. Okay, so that's linear regression. Um, most of the time, though, you're not gonna be making fake data and trying to fit it. Uh, I don't really know anyone who has that job, but good for you if you do. So we'll use some data from Scikit-Learn, uh, the Boston housing data, I know, People are tired of it probably, but it's very easy to get. Okay, so most of you probably have used Scikit-Learn, so you, you know you can load up these different data sets, they have descriptions, uh, features, and test and target values and things like that. So we'll put them into a data frame. Um, I assume most data scientists use data frames, pandas data frames, so much so that we had a tutorial on it this morning. So you think that would be a really easy thing. Um, we'll make the columns of feature names, and for this example, I'm casting some of the variables um, to Boolean types. Um, this chas is uh, a Boolean of like, whether the house is near the Charles River, which is a thing in Boston, I guess. Um, so it's a Boolean variable, it's true or false. It should not be controversial, but as you'll see later, it is. Okay, so I'll train it. I'll split it into a train test set. Um, we'll do some linear regression with scikit-learn just to um, uh, give us a baseline. So it's like 75% accurate. Fine, there's only 400 data points. Um, so now we'll do the same thing with PyMC3. So if you recall earlier when I tried to pronounce Theano, Theano is the back end of PyMC3. Um, one thing you can do is have your inputs and outputs to your model be shared variables and this allows you to easily switch out different sets. So in this case, we can first put in the training set, and then later we can change the value of these shared variables to the testing set, and we don't have to recreate the whole model each time. So we'll make it as the, uh, the training set, and then we'll have the same type of model that we had earlier. 
So just basic linear regression. So we have an alpha, we have the betas, um, we have the model input, um, and the observed is the model output. Okay. Oh, look, we got an error. Who would have thought that would happen? Um, all right. So as tensor error, variable type field must be a tensor type. Have any of you guys seen this before? Do any of you know what it means? No, neither do I. Um, so I spent a few hours working on this, and you get in, you run into these weird errors a lot with PyMC3, I assume because Theano is underneath it. And after a few hours and days of working on this, I finally found some solutions that will let you get past these errors. I have no idea if these are the correct solutions or why they work. So if any of you know that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but this will at least, at least let you keep working um, on your projects. So there's a problem with data frames. For some reason, Pandas data frames don't work in PyMC3 models. Uh, no idea why. So you can turn them into NumPy arrays. And then things mostly seem to work. Oh, wait. No, it didn't. Uh, yeah, look. And now we got the exact same error. Same error, even though it's a different problem. So this is another frustration with Theano and PyMC3. I think this is a lot of why people give up on PyMC3. Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me why we're getting the same error. Uh, but it turns out Booleans don't work either. So cast your Booleans as integers. OK. Um, then I'm obviously doing something wrong with pandas. Shh. Um, so we'll try again. All right. No, it doesn't matter what order you do these two things, whether you change it to an integer or turn the data frame into the NumPy array first, you'll still get those same two errors. I don't really understand why. Okay, so now we'll do it again. We cast the Boolean as an integer. I'm casting the X data as a NumPy array. Um, and we get another error. This time it's attribute error, shared variable object has no attribute shape. Uh, did any of you notice something that you thought I might have, I should have done differently? No. So the thing I didn't do this time is I didn't cast Y as a NumPy array. So remember I said data frames don't work? This is also a data frame. However, we're getting this new interesting error. Why? I don't know. So both, of, both the shared variable error and this variable type field must be a tensor type can be solved by turning your data frames into a NumPy array. Um, it's not clear to me why that works, why you get two different errors, something about Theano. So um, you can get different arrays uh, depending on what's wrong with your data frame. I don't know why. OK, so this time I did everything right. The Boolean, yeah. So what? Oh, shared? Um, it's a variable type in Theano that you can, um, where you can change the value later on. Um, so you can, um, you can first set it up with like your training data and then you can later go on and set the value to be your testing data and you don't have to recreate your whole model. I don't know anything deeper about it. Okay, so hopefully this sampler will start. So again, we have this with model, your model name, uh, block, and then we'll tell it to sample again. If you don't specify a sampler, uh, PyMC3 will choose the best one for your variable types. Um, so I think I've gotten nuts like almost every single time, but you can specify different things or let it choose for you. Okay, any questions? Does anyone have any idea why these errors came up? No, you can have floats and ints in the same array and it's fine. Oh, I see. Uh, under the hood? Oh, I see. Okay, cool.
Cool. Well, now you know. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're sampling, so we're not getting a point and submit. We're getting a distribution. Um, and I will go over what you can do with that distribution right now. Okay, so this one trained, uh, more or less. Um, something weird is happening with one of the betas. Uh, I don't really know why. It's happened every time. Uh, but the other ones seem to have converged. Um, and since this is not real data, I don't care that much. Um, so again, we can look at this trace. Um, we can see the mean and standard deviation. Um, and now if we want to, we can compare with the scikit-learn point estimates. Um, so here we can see the intercept is 38, which is uh, not the mean here, 26. Um, so we're getting a slightly different value. Um, but the betas all look like they're going in the right direction. Um, so now, though, we can score our model and come up, see how it compares to the scikit-learn linear regression. Um, so again, I'm going to cast this Boolean as an integer. And so now you can use the shared variables and just replace them with the testing set. So here you just use, you take your variable name and do set value. I'm casting them as NumPy arrays again. Um, and then you can sample from the posterior um, and use those to score your data. Um, yeah. But different than one? Um, well, the way I think about it, I'm not the best at explaining these, is that instead of just coming up with one single value for your parameters, you're coming up with a distribution for your parameters. So you have some idea of how good your estimate is and how, how much spread there is. Um, so you could come up with a really, uh, you could come up with a point estimate that's actually not that good because the standard deviation is really large. Um, and similarly, you can put in um, prior knowledge that you have. So for example, if you know that one of the parameters is positive for, because you have outside knowledge, you can put that into your model directly. Does that answer your question? The internet probably knows too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry, what was the first part of your question? First question is about what is this charge? Like, what is it, what is it mean when like, the data are like moving around that means more data points? Is it sort of trying to do like a comma filter type of thing where uh, we get every single data point and then that is spent estimating the data? Or what is it, what is moving around for every single data point? I understand you would have a mean and a deviation, but I don't quite clearly understand. Um, yeah. Um, which, both sides? Okay. Um, so the left side are just histograms, distributions. So these are the actual values. So alpha, the mean is like 25. And then on the y-axis is frequency. Well, that's after you've run the trace. It, you have to look at it to figure out if it's converged or not. Um, the right side is sample number on the x-axis and sample value. Um, so it's sort of like, it's the same data, but just sort of turned on a different axis. Um, so basically, you're looking for it to be sort of going towards the same value. But because you're sampling, it's always going to have some noise. But you want it to um, sort of be circling the same value over time. You wouldn't want it to see it like moving around a lot, but you'll see that at the beginning while it's trying to find the, the best fit. Uh, 
Um, You tell me. All right, awesome, thank you. This is a group talk now. Okay, um, cool. Uh, so the sampling, the posterior sampling uh, finished. Um, we're using the R2 score from scikit-learn and we see it's at like 75% uh, accuracy and if we go back up, I think scikit-learn was also at like 75%. So we're doing about the same which makes sense, because it's linear regression, so it'd be really weird if we didn't get the same results. Okay, more questions? It wasn't the same, the, the overall accuracy was the same. Um, well, they're both linear regression, but one is just a point estimate, and one is a, using a distribution for the intercept. Okay. So, hierarchical linear regression. So, this is something that, as far as I can tell, scikit-learn doesn't do as easily, uh, but PyMC3 does it really easily. Um, so, hopefully, some of you guys know what HLMs are. If not, maybe you'll understand this. Um, so, again, I tried to make this really general purpose. So, uh, first, we're going to set up the number of categories. In this case, it's four, but it could be however many you want. Um, the number that we're observing per category. Um, which gives us the number observed and the number of features. Um, so then we just set up a list of all the categories. We're going to simulate the features. Again, we're going to choose um, random, sorry, I'm just going to start the sampling so it starts. Uh, we're going to choose random values for the alphas and betas, and then we're going to make the same data and just throw in a little bit of noise. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. Um, so, Again, we're going to set up a PyMC3 model. Um, because this is an HLM, we're saying that the alphas and the betas are drawn from some parent distribution, which I'm denoting mu alpha and mu beta. All right, and so this is what makes it hierarchical, right? They're all sharing some information. So we can just do the same thing uh, as with linear regression um, and estimate these parameters as well. So we're saying that this mu alpha is also normally distributed. Um, it has some uh, it has a standard deviation associated with it. I just did it as uniform. Um, same thing with the beta. And now when we get to the, the alphas and the betas, instead of saying that they're mean, zero, and standard deviation, whatever I said before, um, now we say that their mean uh, is drawn from these hyperparameters, mu alpha, sigma alpha, and mu beta, sigma beta. Um, and now we don't just have one alpha, we have one alpha per category. All right, and same thing with the betas. We have um, we have a matrix that is the number of categories uh, by the number of features. Um, and now we have to put in a Theano constant for uh, this list of what category they are. All right, let's run some noise again. Um, and now when we um, set up the data, we wanna make sure we're choosing the correct alphas and betas for that category. So that's why we're indexing here on C. All right, does that make sense to everyone? All right, I can see by your confused looks that it does, great. Okay, all right, so here's another fun fact I'll throw in for you. You don't have to use the with model block. Uh, instead, you can just specify what model you want to be sampled. If 
by model equals. So uh, I think I did it both ways throughout the tutorial. That was an accident that I noticed afterwards. Okay, so we can do the same thing and uh, plot these variables. You'll see me doing the same things over and over again. All right, uh, so we have some, uh, it looks like things have converged. Looks pretty good. Um, and we can look at this trace summary again. Uh, but now uh, we have the mu alpha and mu beta data in there as well. Um, and we can go ahead and check what our real values are. Um, so the alphas aren't exact, but it looks like they're heading in the right direction. I'm sure we could do things to make it better. Um, but since this is fake data, I don't really see the point. Okay. Questions about that? So this is the alphas. So there's four categories. So there's four alphas this time. So each of these is one of the alphas. Yes. Yeah, and same with the betas. There should be four categories times three features. Okay, cool. All right, um, so now we can do logistic regression. Um, it'll be very similar to linear regression. Um, so we're gonna set up uh, the same thing. We're gonna specify whatever features we want, the number of observed, um, and then choose uh, random va values for the alphas and the betas. Okay. Um, yeah. So one thing I'm gonna do now is make it so that one of the data points is done. As you might guess, this will set us up for an error later. Okay, so how many of you guys have used ADV? Or have heard of it? One, variational inference. Some of you? Okay, so ADV is a new variational inference technique. I think it's automatic differentiation variational inference. Um, it's a very new technique developed by statisticians, um, and it can, you can think of it as a black box that does parameter estimation for you, which is awesome, because as a data scientist, I don't necessarily wanna know all of the math details. Um, so Pi C3 added it a couple months ago. I think it's coming to Pi Stand soon, but it's not there yet. Um, but it's super fast, um, and you can use the, the parameter estimates that you get out of ADV as the start to a sampler, or you can just use them by themselves. All right, uh-oh, look at this. We got a bunch of not a number of values. So this happens if you try and run ADV on any data that has any uh, NANs or infinities in it. So if we just change it back, it will hopefully start running. Okay. Um, so you can read more about what ADV does, uh, but basically uh, it's another algorithm that has to converge over time. It's doing another type of sampling, and uh, you're looking for something called the elbow. So it's this curve that hopefully bends and straightens out, and when it sort of converges like that, you know that it's done, which is nice. Um, so they have uh, some easy ways to plot that data. Okay. So. Uh, with ADV, you're also getting um, uh, an estimate of the distribution, so you can sample from that distribution, the same way we were sampling from the other distributions. So here I'm going to, oh, it's already done. I'm gonna sample from the variational inference distribution, and now we can also train, uh, we can also use the nut sampler um, with these ADV estimations. So here I'm saying use the standard deviations as a scaling and start uh, at the ADV uh, mean parameter estimates. All right, so you, uh, they're not necessarily in conflict with one another. You can use either of them separately or you can combine them. And sometimes you get better or worse results. All right, um, so same thing. We're gonna see these plots a lot. All right, more trace. Um, in this case, uh, we can test our testing set again. So the same thing I did before, shared value, set uh, value. Um, and now we can sample from the ADV trace and figure out the accuracy, or we can sample from the NUTS trace and figure out the accuracy there. And hopefully it'll happen pretty quickly. Um, 
So you can see that the, uh, the way you call the, the posterior samplers is the same regardless of which trace you're using, whether it's an AdV trace or a nuts trace. Uh, you can just throw it in. All right, questions while things are running? All right, well, I'm gonna have a drink of water. You guys can entertain yourselves. Okay, so now you see the problem with using sampling algorithms in a tutorial is you often have to spend a lot of time waiting. Um, so, hopefully it'll go. It's the same, it's estimating the same parameters as the uh, MCMC samplers. It's just another technique. So you could use MAP or ADV or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will provide you with the same type of estimate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, one of them finished, 80% accuracy. Pretty good for fake data, I guess. Um, hopefully the nuts will finish. Um, so, as we're sitting here, you can probably see the nuts takes, the Markov chain Monte Carlo samplers take a lot longer than ADV, uh, which is why I don't use them as much anymore. I mostly just use ADV, um, because I don't wanna leave things running for three weeks, because <coughs> Our DevOps guys get mad when I leave our AWS thing up that long. All right, uh, in this case you can see the accuracy was about the same. So we probably could have gotten away with just using ADV. There might be other situations where you need to use both of them, uh, but you can play around and test. Okay, so we have a model now, um, a basic logistic regression one. One thing you might need to do at your job is predict future data, and maybe you wanna turn your model into an API, um, which is something I've done. With PyMC3, you're not gonna save uh, the actual model object. You won't save this. What you actually wanna save is just the trace, and then you can rebuild uh, your model later. So the trace is the important part. Right? It has all the information about your sampling. Um, so what you could do is, I'm not gonna do it now, uh, but here's the code for it. You could maybe save the trace as a pickle, and then reopen it later uh, in wherever your API lives. Um, you can also use, uh, there's a few different back ends available for this. Um, I think you can use SQLite and you could write your own depending on how big your data is or what your needs are. Okay, um, so let's say we wanna create some test data. Um, so again, we're just randomly setting some stuff. Um, so because you don't know the final value, you're predicting it, you might think hey, I can just specify the model input because I don't know the model output. Oh, too bad, you were wrong for thinking that. Okay, so you get this weird error about shapes um, and the reason seems to be because you didn't specify an output model, uh, an output value. Doesn't really make sense to me. I think this is something they're trying to work on because you shouldn't have to put in an observed value if you don't actually have an observed value. Um, but for now, just put in some fake observed data. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna put in one as the fake data uh, because the real data is zero. Um, so here, you can see that I put in the fake data as our fake Y, um, and now everything is working and we're not getting weird shape errors. Okay, um, so now it's gonna use the trace that you may have pickled and saved, or in this case, just gotten from earlier in the notebook, um, it's gonna use this model that we just set up um, and sample from the posterior again. Um, then you can use that, uh, the posterior samples to make your prediction. And hopefully it will run. Okay, I'm gonna start some other stuff running because it takes a long time, but I will go over it. So. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Um, well, so this is something you might use if 
you're getting in new data and you know the X, but you don't know the Y, but you want to make a prediction for it. So you've trained your data on some X and Y, but now you want to predict future data. Yes, exactly. That's the weird thing. Yeah. Yes, it is. I agree. It's weird. I don't know why it's like that. Uh, go into their Gitter channel and ask them. Uh, this has come up a few times. Um, okay, but if you look here, we can see that even though we put in a predicted value of true, it, the model has correctly figured out that the value is false. And so it's changed that. Uh, it gives us back a prediction of false, even though we put in our prediction as true. Yeah. Yeah, for this API version, just one. Uh, let's see. Uh, I had 10 features. Yes, sometimes this takes a super long time. Um, I'm sure there are things you can do to speed it up. Um, but I think it's like these sampling things just can take a really long time. Yeah, so you could do a smaller number of samples if you wanted, um, however many you wanted to do it. Maybe there's a, I don't know, yeah. I'm sure there are performance things you could do. Okay, questions? No? Okay, I just realized I have a lot of time left and only one example left. So you might get some free time. Okay. So uh, the last example I have is hierarchical logistic regression. It'll look very similar to the hierarchical linear regression. Um, so again, you can set up however many categories you want. Um, in this case, I did four. Um, the number of categories, the number observed. This should hopefully make sense. Um, again, we need to come up with this list of categories so we can uh, index by them later. We'll simulate the features, um, the alphas and the betas, and the actual data. Um, and now we have this hierarchical model. Um, so similarly to the hierarchical linear regression, these are really hard to say, uh, we have hyperparameters uh, that the alphas and betas are drawn from. So conveniently, I also called them mu alpha and mu beta. Um, I, I gave them the same types of distribution, um, normal and uniform. And again, you can see that our alphas and betas now have means of mu alpha um, and mu beta. Um, and the same thing again, we have uh, the, the number of alphas we have is the same as the number of categories, and the number of betas we have to estimate now is the number of categories and the number by the number of features. Okay, any questions about that? All right, um, so I started running ADVI, but because this is a more complicated model and we have more data, it's probably gonna take a long time. Uh, so, yeah, anyone have questions while we're waiting for things to sample? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea. I haven't done time varying parameter estimates. Does anyone else know at the back? That seems plausible. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of it is from Theano. Um, so I don't know if they've, I don't know, somebody's working on Theano, right? Um, probably. Um, I don't know. They seem pretty fast. The PIMC3 people seem really fast at responding to errors. Um, so maybe it'll get better. I know like this uh, API thing where you have to put in fake data is something they're working on. Um, they have a whole bunch of open issues. 
um, and they're super fast at responding. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked into all of that stuff. Um, I haven't needed to do as much performance enhancement things. Um, yes, I'm pretty sure there are. I ha also have not used that. Uh, but I definitely know there's some stuff about chains. <laughs> Yeah? Uh, I think it's just faster. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's the reason I use it. Um, I don't know if there are other reasons. Um, I know they des the people who created AdV designed it to be more of a black box. Um, so I think part of it is maybe you don't have to understand all the nuances uh, that you might have to with samplers and like all the decisions you can make with sampling but I recommend you just try it and see if it works for you. Yeah. Well, usually you'll know the number of categories um, because the data will be labeled in some way. So like that Iris data set uh, that's in scikit-learn has three categories and you know that. Um, at my job, uh, we have data that comes from different markets. So I know the number of markets um, and I know there's gonna be differences in markets. Um, I think you'd have to use something else if you were trying to discover the number of categories. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, you need to already know what the category is. Uh, okay, so maybe the iris one was a slightly poor example. So this isn't if you're trying to figure out what category it is, it's if the category is a feature of your data. Okay. So, wait. I see. So then, I see. So, so, you're talking about a situation where um, you have a categorical variable set. Yes. It's not like a, right, like a gender or a state or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so then you would pull out the categories as this list of categories and it would uh, no longer be a direct feature, but you would uh, get to it by indexing the appropriate alphas and betas. So you potentially could then, say you've got the other data, run it in by for each of the models for the three categories, see how well it's the models are doing, what you already know about, say, the other data, and then whichever one's more accurate, you could do whatever you need to do. Try it. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Yeah, so you don't have to use samplers for hierarchical models. It's just easier because it's more or less out of the box. Uh, so that's why I started using this library. Um, I'm sure you could do all of the math and analytically do something in some cases. Uh, it depends on your data, but um, it, I think it will it will definitely change the amount of time it takes to converge. Um, so you might find that if your standard deviation is really wrong, you'll have to, it'll take longer to converge. Um, 
or you can just test a few different uh, values of it. So yes, it can mess things up, but not irreparably. Okay, uh, yeah, so things are gonna take a while. Um, yeah, I didn't realize it would take this long. Uh, good thing I still have a lot of time left. So um, we can stand here and watch this try and converge, or you guys can keep asking questions. You can walk around, whatever you want. Um, so eventually, this should keep running. Hopefully, it's happening on yours as well. Um, one thing I wanted to note is if we ever get to the point where this is sampling, if you accidentally specify like 20,000 or 200,000 samples, you can actually stop your sampling in the middle and you'll still be able to use your trace. Um, it'll just be however much you're using and you can still do the trace plots and summaries and all of that stuff will still work. So, uh, is your time degree a system that you Um, well, we are trying to use it in production at ShiftGig right now. Um, I think, as you mentioned, the trace, even just sampling for one data point can take a long time. So we're sort of weighing, weighing the options. Um, you could just take uh, the means and standard deviations and just use those as a point estimate and just do the training. Um, I like the idea of doing the sampling and sort of having a better idea of how good our estimate is. Uh, so. We'll see what DevOps has to say and how much they can help me and what my boss thinks. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's just an array. Um, it might have some more information in it. I don't, I'm not sure. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is as much as I know about Theano. Yeah, uh, no, you'll run into all of these weird errors, yeah. and hopefully somebody else will have solved them, like me, um, or you spend a lot of time uh, on Stack Overflow trying to figure out why these errors happened. Um, but yeah, I still don't understand they know that much. I probably should know more. Uh, but you know, it's hard when your boss is like, get something out. Um, I would like to more, know more Theano. Someone wants to give a tutorial on that, please do. Okay, yeah, so this is just gonna sample. Uh, uh, so right now I'm doing AdV and then I was gonna feed that into nuts. Um, um, I, yeah, on other problems I have. Um, this is the ad view that's taking a long time because the data is more complicated. And I conveniently put in a version without ad view but forgot to use that one. So. Cool, well that was a lot shorter than I thought it'd be. That's why I used it. Uh, I knew I wanted something hierarchical, and um, as far as I can tell, there's not that many other existing libraries that'll let you do it that easily. Uh, obviously, PyStan could use it. Um, but yeah, I think it just, if you have to build more complicated models, if you like doing Bayesian modeling, if you have a lot of prior knowledge that you want to put in, uh, you should use it. Did you have a question? Did I imagine you raising your hand? Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're on my GitHub repo. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know. I haven't written a custom step method, but I would be surprised if they had taken that out. 
Uh, I think they like the idea of you being able to write custom step methods and backends and stuff. So, hey, it's almost running. Okay, um, yeah, like I said, there's another version of the notebook that doesn't have any of the errors in it. Um, so if you wanna be able to just pull code out and not run into the errors, I suggest you use that one instead. Um, but in all of these blocks uh, that I wrote where I was doing the code twice, um, I put in comments showing where I changed things. Um, so if you need to see where the error arose, uh, just look for these change comments. Oh, okay, cool. So this elbow doesn't look as great. It's kind of a double elbow. Um, but it looks like it's converging, it's good enough. Um, so hopefully the nuts sampler will start, but this will also take a long time because it's sampling. Um, yeah, so this is was my life for like three months was just waiting for things to sample. And then every day my scrum update would be, it's still running. And my, <laughs> the VP of product was like, what does that mean? And I was like, yeah, it's, that's how sampling works. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Luckily, he did not know any better, so he couldn't argue. Yeah. Okay, yeah, like I said, this is all I have. It was, I must have spoken more quickly than I thought I would. So you guys get an extra long break. You chose the right tutorial. <laughs>